Today I'm going to recap and take a look at week six AP college football poll and all that's coming up after the bumper. What do you mean you don't subscribe to my son's YouTube channel? Mama, no! Just snap the damn ball, RJ. What's up, kid folks? It's RJ Young. I am not on a step mill. Consider hitting the like and subscribe button because I upload a video every single day. It's always OU related, college football related, sports related. We have a good time. And today, I want to take a look at week six of the AP college football poll. I know that the poll is the living and breathing thing, but there are always things to take away from it, especially as we approach day 37, the countdown to the college football playoff rankings, the ones that will really matter. But until then, the Associated Press poll is the best poll that we have at our disposal because we can't trust the coaches to actually give a damn. Now, at number one, we got a new number one, Alabama, right? After they skull-dragged Ole Miss. Now, I understand that Devontae Smith had like 274 yards receiving and that Tua Tonga-Valoa is just ho-hum awesome. But that Bama defense gave up 279 yards rushing and gave up back-to-back 100-yard -back rushers for the first time this season. Uh, well, not back-to-back, -back, excuse me. Back-to-back -back in the SEC. Rico Dottle at South Carolina had over 100 yards on like 12 carries. And then, well, John Plumley, right, got the edge against a Bama deep run defense. And, and that's just awkward, right? That's just, what? So in taking a look at that, I understand that Saban is starting five freshmen on the defense, but as Gary Daniels likes to tell us all the time, doesn't he just put out another five-star? I think the run defense at Alabama is a problem. That said, the offense is ridiculous, and it is on par with what Oklahoma is doing. I can see them at number one, but I also think it's a lazy vote by the voters who just don't like number two Clemson after the North Carolina game because, yeah, it was a one-point win, and I understand that you're thinking, man, this Clemson team is just the best team in the worst conference in college football to date. Fight me. But North Carolina also had a game plan. And for the first time, I saw Brent Venables outmanned and outdueled by an ACC defensive coordinator. I've never seen that. Jay Bateman had a plan, and his plan worked. You also got help from Clemson, who had false start penalties, illegal procedure penalties, 12 men on the field, just wasn't solid offensively. But on that... It wasn't like North Carolina didn't know what they wanted to do. They wanted to try to take away the advantage that Clemson has inherently, which is talent. Because you could see that, yeah, they played outstanding defense, but they also took their time running the ball or running plays, right? Because like that last drive, I think they had, it was like eight minutes. That's an eternity. That's like a lifetime. And if you could do that against a Clemson defense, my goodness, that's, I know we don't believe in moral victories, but... In college football, we kind of do because this is the only sport where you can have a bad win, Clemson, and a good loss, North Carolina. North Carolina is a solid football team, and they're probably going to be pretty good by the end of the year and excellent next year. Mac Brown is doing an outstanding job there, and Sam Howell knows that he can play with those guys now, and that's going to be huge for his confidence as they move forward. So I could understand Clemson at two, but I would have left him at one because I still think they're the best team in college football today when it comes time to pick who's going to be in the college football playoff. That said, 1-2 with Alabama and Clemson. We're just going to see that. Number three, Georgia. Cool. Undefeated against a bye week, as we all are. Coming off of a really good victory against Notre Dame. I was at that game. I had a lot of fun at that game. I thought Georgia got a little more tested than they want to be, but Notre Dame's defense also showed up and played lights out against, I mean, a Georgia football team that was outstanding and really couldn't move the ball the way that they want to. Now, I'd also say that Jake Fromm needs to be allowed to cook, and maybe we'll see more of that, but I would not be surprised to see a Georgia team beat an SEC West team in a conference championship. Certainly wouldn't be surprised if LSU goes into Tuscaloosa and gets a win against Alabama when it comes time to play that game, which is why it's easy for me to see. No, it's not. Ohio State at number four. Ohio State beat the bricks off in Nebraska, and I understand that there's a lot of people that want to take away something from that. But Nebraska was 4-8 last season. They ain't played nobody this season. They never look like threatening. And if you want to count the Colorado loss as threatening, fine, whatever. I mean, but if that's the toughest game on your schedule and you needed four points to beat Illinois, which nobody takes seriously, we can understand how bad the Big Ten West is. And Ohio State also needed to go into a Big Ten West stadium and just dunk on somebody because they've had two bad losses in Big Ten West stadiums that have kept them out of the college football playoff, and it was very clear Ryan Day wasn't going to let that happen, and man, could they run all day? Well, what? But more than that, Ohio State's defense is for real, right? They can absolutely play defense, and that's after changing the coordinator, bringing in a couple new guys to help them figure out who they are and what they're going to be. 
Ohio State is scary good, but I'm not going to vote them the number one team in the country like some have because they beat a bad Nebraska team. It just goes to show you that the primetime game matters when it comes to voting because more voters are going to watch that game because it's readily available to them unless they're covering some other game, right? Which is also why the Pac-12 has a point when they say, I don't think enough people are watching our games or the 11 a.m. kick doesn't really help anybody because there are other games that are following even though it's a good broadcast window. At number five, we got LSU, who was, had a bye week, and we've seen Oklahoma got knocked for a bye week, down a peg. LSU gets knocked for a bye week, down a peg, because Ohio State played and played very well. LSU is still that team, right? I think that they could still come out of the SEC West, and nobody should be shocked by that, because Bama needs to clean up its defense against SEC opponents, because they played two of the worst SEC teams in college football in South Carolina and, of course, Ole Miss, and they haven't looked great defensively. LSU has looked outstanding offensively, and Joe Burrow is very much in the Heisman Trophy conversation. Just we need them to do it for the rest of the year and see what they do, particularly against Alabama and then Auburn, and then we'll see about the SEC championship game. Oklahoma at number six after a destruction of Texas Tech. Jalen Hurts goes for over 400 yards passing you had an outstanding showing by the defense that gave up 16 points. That is the fewest amount of points that Oklahoma has given up to Texas Tech since 2010. And they were 1 of 14 on third down. And they went 0 for 8 until they got their first third down conversion. Oklahoma is the number two team in the country when it comes to defending third downs. Alex Grinch has to feel good about his defense, even as the secondary still has some work to do. And Kenneth Murray Jr. is out there earning some money. Numbers. Seven is Auburn. We got a 300-yard passing performance out of Bo Nix, and now I don't know what to think about Auburn. They're just kind of, if they're figuring out and it's coming together, it's coming together at the right time because they get Florida, and they're going to have to start to challenge in a real way. But I thought that that game against Mississippi State was going to be just a little closer. It was not. Bo Nix was, looked good out there moving around. We all know that the defense is full of more real monsters, specifically on the defensive line. But watching Auburn do what Auburn did – their most complete game to date and all of a sudden they have earned this this ranking man of five of number seven at five and oh and we could see them and how they would be ahead of Wisconsin and number eight which wasn't necessarily great in their game but you know after what you did against Michigan we knew Northwestern wants to dumb the game down we knew that Northwestern plays particularly well against Big Ten competition and if Pat Fitzgerald had a little bit more talent maybe they could do something but I came away thinking that Northwestern is not going to be an easy out for many teams and that Wisconsin can win a game that, frankly, they had to grind out. But we're going to find out a lot about Wisconsin here this month of October because they got to go up against Ohio State. That's going to be a lot of fun. Number nine, we got Notre Dame 3-1. and one. Got a good win against a top 25 Virginia team, even though they gave up like 235 passing in the first half. They pulled it together. Bryce Perkins is still look like a dude, but Ian Book is coming together, and Tony Jones looked good running the ball for the first time in several weeks. Seems like Notre Dame is going to right itself, but with the one loss, they're going to need some help, specifically because they needed they need Georgia to be good, right? They need Georgia to, to continue to just pound on people. But I don't have a problem with them at number nine. Florida at five, they beat up on Towson. I did this segment earlier about just what it means for SEC competition to schedule one another and how much we would like to see that. But they play Towson. They're 5-0. Now Kyle Trask gets to prove it against a good SEC opponent. At number 11, you got Texas. All right, cool. Bye week. But they're decimated in the secondary. They really have to figure out who they are defensively. Todd Orlando is going to keep trying to send five and six at a time. And maybe that'll work against lesser teams, but Jalen Hurts is going to figure that out. Charlie Brewer is going to figure that out. I dare say Brock Purdy is going to figure that out. Spencer Sanders is going to figure that out. I don't know what they're going to do in their secondary, but they got to figure it out because they get Oklahoma in just two weeks' time. Number 12, Penn State. Their destruction of Maryland was awesome to watch and awesome to see. And it also showed you just how deep the Big Ten East is. James Franklin has somehow... Managed to get to 4-0 kind of sleepily, quite, kind of quietly. Didn't look great against Buffalo. Didn't look great against Pittsburgh. And then decided to throw out against Mike Loxley and Josh Jackson in an outstanding offense. It's a good win for them. But they're going to get tested too. Oregon at number 13, sitting at 3-1. and one, Needed a bye week after a really good performance against Stanford. We'll see who they are. I mean, they get Washington here in a little bit. And I'm really interested to see whether or not Chris Peterson's team can beat that Oregon team because we've expected that Oregon team to be good for a very long time and perhaps to be the Pac-12 champ. And at the beginning of the season, nobody would have been shocked to see that team 
in the college football playoff. But we'll see what Justin Herbert and the boys get figured out coming into this week. Iowa at number 14. It's very rare that I get to say that Iowa had more athletes than a football team, but they got more athletes than Middle Tennessee State, and it showed. We're not going to take a whole lot from that, except Iowa is still undefeated at 4-0, and good luck to you if you have them on their, on your schedule because that's going to be a tough game for anybody who has to play it. Washington at 15 played a USC team. We don't really know what to get from or what we're going to get from, and Washington still has – a lot left on its schedule that it's going to have to show some people. But with the loss against Cal, I got a hard time seeing them getting into the top 10. I'll get to why in a little bit. Number 16, Boise State coming off a of bye week. They lost their leading tackler to an ACL injury. Linebacker, we'll see what they can do against their Mountain West Conference play competition. But if Boise State runs the table, I would have loved to see them have an opportunity to get in the college football playoff, but they ain't. They're going to be the group of 16 if they just keep this up. Utah at 17. They look like the air raid team against Washington State. Like, I watched some of that game. And I was going, wait a second, Tyler Huntley airing the ball out? This is new. And it was kind of a weird game to watch because there was, you know, a lightning delay and there were well, lightning in the area. So you got this all 22 view. And it just didn't look like a great game for Washington State anyway. But seeing Utah be able to bounce back from a loss against that USC team and she'll show that they got some pride to them and they got some get after it, go up into, what was it? Yeah, and, and just get a, get a W. I think that's going to be absolutely outstanding for them later on. That Washington State win is going to look good, even though we got the UCLA game and so forth and so on. UCF at 18, they beat up on a UConn team that ain't even going to have a conference next year. Okay, whatever. Uh, Michigan at 19, Rutgers kill, uh, cures all ills, right? Michigan beats the brakes off Rutgers. Shout out to OK Preps, Booker T. Washington, Dax Hill, who just destroyed a punt returner. That was fun to watch. I'm glad Shea Patterson got a good game out of it, but that might be their last good game for a very long time because Rutgers is just got awful. At number 20, we got Arizona State. Got a really good win against the Cal team that a lot of people did not pick them to win in. I picked Arizona State straight up and against the spread. The Fighting Herm Edwards know what they're doing. They know who they are, and they're going to probably push for an opportunity to represent the Pac-12 South in that Pac-12 championship. I'm very excited to see what Herm Edwards, Jaden Daniels, Eno Benjamin, those boys can do. That defense is stout. And them winning a rock fight against Cal, huge. Also really bad for Washington because Cal looked like it was going to be a pretty good football team and is still going to be a pretty good football team off a win against a bad SEC team. But we'll see how that works out for them with the rest of their schedule. Number 21, Oklahoma State undervalued all year. I had picked Kansas State to win that game, and then Oklahoma State looked like the class of the game the whole time. Chuba Hubbard is on another level. He is by far the best Big 12 running back in the conference, and he has done something no other running back in Oklahoma State history has done, which is get three 200-yard rushing games in his first five. Look outstanding. 25 carries, 296 yards. He is number one in running back yardage by a landslide in front of J.K. Dobbins by like 284 yards, and that's amazing. Chuba Hubbard is going to make a lot of money in the NFL. I'm getting really excited to watch him play football. And Oklahoma State versus OU, that Bedlam game, is going to be an absolute awesome game. I may not pick against Oklahoma State the rest of the year, except against Oklahoma. Yeah, except against Oklahoma. That's, that's probably it. I think they should be favored in pretty much every other game they play. They're at 21. Wake Forest at 22 goes up to Boston College, gets a W. Wasn't pretty, but they got it. I understand that we're all down on Boston College because they took an L from Kansas on the road. Now they take an L from the fighting Dave Clausens on the uh, at home. It's just not good. Steve Adazio team is probably going to be searching for a new job. Shouts out to Jamie Newman and the boys, Boogie Basham. All of a sudden, Wake Forest looks like an absolute squad. And that win against North Carolina looks even better. At number 22, we got Virginia. Took the L, first L of the season to Notre Dame. Still... They acquitted themselves well. Virginia could still do some things later on in the year, but UVA is starting to look like UVA, and I remembered them this week. At number 24, SMU, 5-0 and when nobody's looking. With a big win against TCU last week, 41-38. And then, like everybody else, they destroy South Florida. Sonny Dykes, Shane Bouchelle, they got something going down there. I mean, I love Van Malone, and I love what he's been able to do. I think SMU might be able to challenge for that American title, but Memphis still feels like the favorite. Of course, Central Florida is still in there. American's becoming a lot of fun, and the American might be a better conference. Not might be. The American is a better conference than the ACC right now. It's just what it is. And at number 25, A&M. Somehow, voters just want to keep a 3-2 and two A&M in this thing after they nearly got beat down by the worst SEC team 
in football, Arkansas. The Arkansas team that I just did like, you know, a documentary on that ain't very good. Jimbo Fisher is stealing, right, in that $75 million. Kellen Mond looks awful when he just gets to sit back there and think, which is supposed to be a strong suit of every quarterback. And you got out of that game in the Cotton Bowl, a neutral field, by the way, alive. And I, I more to say anything, this says more about how bad A&M is than how good Arkansas is, all right? I understand Arkansas is going to be like, no, we're getting something together, and you might be, but just awful for A&M. And I, don't, I wouldn't put them in there. I, why are they still ranked here? I don't understand. And then others receiving votes. Michigan State got 147 points. California got 141 points. Memphis got 71 points. Appalachia State just continues to destroy people, 50 points. Army got 44. Mizzou got 26. Baylor got 19 with a really good win against Iowa State at home. Iowa State scored 21 unanswered in the fourth after being down 20-0. That was a lot of fun. I was really into that game. I had picked Iowa State to win that game. Baylor said, no, we're coming to get this, and they got a kicker to come off the bench to win it for them late. Really good win for them. Colorado got 19. Minnesota got 15 quietly undefeated. And their group of five non-conference schedule was the toughest group of five non-conference schedule that I've ever seen. They got a really good win against Purdue in a pick'em game. All of a sudden, row your boat is going to be there, and they might be, I don't know, challenging for the Big Ten West. We'll see. Tulane got a vote. USC got seven, and Kansas State got one after they really were outclassed, outdueled, and beat down by Oklahoma State and Stillwater on ESPN+. Plus. That broadcast was just all kinds of weird and local, and I understand Ed Ashoff was doing his best because I could hear him reading, and I've been there when you're trying to read something out loud live. Sometimes it comes off, sometimes it doesn't. Ray Bentley was having the time of his life, and I enjoyed him. Even when he made a mistake, he was having a joke. He was having a good time. All right, that is it for me. That was 